I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, Twill be the old, old story That I have loved so long. I love to tell the story, Twill be my theme in glory, To tell the old, old story, Of Jesus and his love. Talking about a man named George from Houston, Texas. In the late 50s and early 60s, George was pretty much a thug in South Houston. Beat people up for lunch money. Found he enjoyed it, so he would mug people just for the fun of it. Was redirected by some people into boxing and became pretty good at boxing. Became the gold medal winner in the Olympics in the late 60s for heavyweight boxing. Became rather successful at boxing. Made it a good bit of money in the process. Then something happened with a favorite nephew of his. Favorite nephew went into a coma, and while we, he was in the coma, they didn't expect him to come out. If he did come out, he was expected to be a vegetable. So not a very pretty situation. George then, upon hearing that, volunteered to take whatever money he had, anything, to get the best doctors in the world to fly into Houston and take care of his nephew. George was told, money's not going to solve this. There is no solution. Try a prayer. Well, for George, that was an unheard of thing. He had no experience with that whatsoever. But he cared so much for the nephew that he did start to pray. And he was dealing with God. You know, make a deal with God. If I, you know, God, if you'll do this, then I'll do that. And we've all done that on occasion, probably. But George did it, and the nephew came out of the coma did regain all of his abilities. And George went on with his fighting. So George really didn't do anything. And George went on fighting. Actually, George was heavyweight champion of the world. It's George Foreman, if you hadn't guessed. George was heavyweight champion of the world and had lost the championship to, what was his name? Cassius Clay or Muhammad Ali. And George was fighting his way back into another championship fight with Ali. That's what his goal was. He had won several fights in coming back. And George lost the fight unexpectedly. He was expected to win. He lost it in 12 rounds on a decision to this relatively unknown fighter. In the dressing room after the fight, George passed out. And if you listen to George's explanation of the story, George says, I died in the locker room after that fight. And he wrote a book, and it's God in My Corner, a spiritual memoir. George, when he passed out, saw himself in a very dark place. And in his mind, it was clear that he believed that he was headed toward hell. And he prayed again and claimed that he believed in God. And he said that he felt a hand grasp him and pull him out of the darkness. And George became a Christian. George was a street preacher for a while and became a pastor in a church. Now, you know him for the George Foreman Grill, obviously, right? I mean, that's everybody owns one of those. They only sold 180 million of them. So, hey, you probably have one or your family does. But George recognized that all the money that he had through all his winnings really didn't matter. All the power that he had in his hands really didn't matter. Couldn't solve the major problems couldn't solve the problem of his nephew, couldn't solve the problem of his life after his death. And if he was going to die and go to that other place, that was not a very comfortable place to go. So George learned a lot about power. We're going to talk about power today. We're going to talk about Samson and where the real source of power lies. Norman, when you think of Samson, what do you think of? First word comes into your mind. Delilah. 
in almost every case, the first word that will come to your mind is Delilah. Well, we're going to mention Delilah briefly, but that's not the main thing of the story. A few questions to begin. How can it be that someone possesses a great power and lives a powerless life? Lives as if there is no power in their life whatsoever. Yet there is a great power that they have. Let me rephrase that just a little bit. Have you ever heard ever or maybe known someone who was thought to be extremely poor, living on cat food, dog food, you know, just hardly getting by? And then when they die, it's learned that they had a tremendous amount of money. Maybe a million dollars in a bank account or stashed away a lot of money. You've all heard stories like that. Did they have any financial resources? They had more than enough to do anything that they could imagine. And yet they didn't live that way, did they? They didn't live as if they had any money at all. Well, there are people who live their lives that way as well. They have tremendous power. It's like a George Foreman. If he, with that bulk and strength, physical strength that he had, but if he never did anything with it except sew, sat in his living room and knit, I mean, that's a tremendous amount of power that's there that isn't used. Well, people don't use the power that is available to them. It's unlikely that you use all the power that's available to you. I know I don't use all the power that's available to me. And we're going to look at that in some detail today. But why would someone take for granted the power of God working in their life? Have you seen anybody take for granted that power? Why would they do that? Or any power. It doesn't have to be the power of God. Any power. Why would they take a power, a strength that they have, and take it for granted? Just assume that it's always going to be there. All about me. All about me. Sometimes we begin to assume that it's really my power. Sometimes that power that God gives an individual is something we become so accustomed to having that we begin to believe that it is ours and it's all about me and that I have that power in my hand and I can do with it as I see fit. What does it cost to have the power of God in your life? Commitment. Commitment. You see, if I don't have that, then I can be all about me and I can focus on me. But if I have the power of God working in my life, then it's not about me. I know that it's not about me. It is about some other people. I have a commitment to other people, and I am going to need to serve some other folks. And we're not particularly good in general at serving. We like being in the position of power so that people are serving us. And if you haven't had that attitude, you certainly know people who have who are in a position of power, love that position of power, and love to have people serving them. So how can that strength that a person believes that they have become weakness? Have you ever seen a strength become a weakness? I used to do corporate planning. And in that, you know, you talk about strengths and weaknesses of an organization. And one of the things you learn very quickly is that many times your strengths are your weaknesses and your weaknesses are your strengths. But for an individual as well, the strength that you have in your life can quickly become a weakness. How can that be? If you don't use it, then it certainly becomes a weakness. If you misuse it, then what you saw as a strength and as an opportunity to do something positive with what you have, and then it works the other way, then it becomes a big weakness in your life. So there are several ways that that can happen. What's the importance of a symbol of something? And I use the American flag because we're seeing it abused in some cases. And, but it's a symbol of something, isn't it? And when somebody abuses the symbol, then other people who see that symbol as being significant are deeply offended by what they see. So what is the importance of the symbol? If somebody burns the flag, does the country suffer? I mean, does the nation suffer? Well, in a way, indirectly it does. But overall, I mean, we're still who we are and we still march forward. But it's still significant, isn't it? If somebody does something to the symbol, then that does something to the people for whom the symbol is significant. Why is it important? It could be prestige. A certain country like the Britain, the world, 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 the world
Well, and certainly, I mean, it means something not only to the people in a nation, and it doesn't have to be just flags now, but if for a flag, it's not just the people in the nation, but it's the people outside who view that nation in a certain way, and they see that symbol as representing what that nation stands for. Other symbols work the same way, don't they? I mean, there are things that are in your life that are symbols of something else. This is an important aspect of the life of a culture or a life of an individual. The symbols, the things that stand for something bigger, maybe something abstract. So you have this physical thing reminding you of that something that is just a concept. We're going to see that with Samson. Samson has a symbol of his power, and that is a part of our story. So what do people consider to be the source of power? Themselves. Many people consider themselves to be the source of all power. It's all about me. What else? Well, the obvious Sunday school answer, of course, is God, right? We know that one. What are other things that people consider to be the source of power? Money. Money Money is a source of power in the minds of many people. If I can accumulate the money, then that's the power. The government. The government, yes. That's an issue these days too, isn't it? That people believe that the government is almost godlike. That is the power. I have a clip for you this morning from the movie Lucy. Lucy is a science fiction kind of movie. It's rated R for the violence in it. The clip I'm going to show you has no violence in it. This movie deals with some ideas that are significant. The answers that they give to the questions they raise are not the answers that I would give. In fact, they're contrary to the answers that I would give. But I like to watch movies like that because I like to see how other people think and how they would deal with these things. And that gives me and you a better opportunity to deal with those people and perhaps help them understand truth. In the movie Lucy, Scarlett Johansson plays Lucy. The thing up here, many of you in the back probably can't read, it says the average person uses 10% of their brain capacity. Imagine what she could do with 100%. But one of the things you often heard is that people use at most 10% of their brain. What they're talking about here is capacity of the brain, the ability of the brain to do something. I Sometimes I doubt if I use 10% of the capacity of my brain. Think about all the things that you could do. If you really set your mind to it and sat down and did them, you don't do that. You don't do everything that you could possibly do. The movie is about what happens if a person can actually use 100% of their brain capacity. And Lucy is headed for that quite by accident she happens to get injected with some drugs. And because of that, her brain is unleashed and she charges toward 100% usage of the brain. Morgan Freeman is a professor who's written thousands of pages of research on the brain. And what you're going to see is three scenes. The first scene is going to be with Morgan Freeman lecturing a university class in Paris about the brain. And then you're going to see a brief clip of Lucy talking to the professor via the television about what's happening to her and about all the knowledge that she's gathering because of this unleashed uh, usage of the brain. And then the final scene is going to be closer to the end where she meets face-to-face with the professor and some other professors, and they have one interesting little scene there that I'm going to show you. And then we'll talk about it just a little bit more when we finish. Let's imagine for a few moments what our life would be like if we could access, let's say, 20% of our brain's capacity. This first stage would give us access to and control of our own body. 100 billion neurons per human, of which only 15% are activated. There are more connections in the human body than there are stars in the galaxy. We possess a gigantic network of information to which we have almost no access. Well, the next stage would probably be control of other people. But for that, we would need to access at least 40% of our brain's capacity. After control of ourselves and others, would come control of matter.
Excuse me, sir. Yes. But what would happen if somebody unlocked 100% of the cerebral capacity? 100%? Yes. I have no idea. Yes? Professor Norman, my name's Lucy. I just read all your research on the human brain. We need to meet. <laughs> all of my research? 6,734 pages. I can recite them to you all by heart if you wish. Are you one of Emily's friends? This sounds like one of her silly jokes. Is she there with you? No, no, ma'am. Your theory is not a theory. I absorbed a large quantity of synthetic CPH4 that will allow me to use 100% of my cerebral capacity. Right now I'm at 28%. And what she wrote is true. Once the brain reaches 20%, it opens up and expands the rest. There are no more obstacles. They fall away like dominoes. I'm colonizing my own brain. You can control your own metabolism? Yes. And I can start to control other people's bodies. Also, I can control magnetic and electric waves. Um, not all of them, just the most basic. Television. Telephone. Radio. That's amazing. I don't feel pain, fear, desire. It's like all things that make us human are fading away. It's like the less human I feel, all this knowledge about everything, they're all exploding inside my brain, all this knowledge. I don't know what to do with it. If you think about the very nature of life, I mean, from the very beginning, this whole purpose of life has been to pass on what was learned. That there was no higher purpose. So if you're asking me what to do with all this knowledge you're accumulating, I say, pass it on. We've codified our existence to bring it down to human size, to make it comprehensible. We've created a scale so that we can forget its unfathomable scale. But if humans are not the unit of measure, and the world isn't governed by mathematical laws, what governs all that? The theme of the movie is knowledge is power. I mean, that's what it's all about. It's about knowing. Get all this information together. That's where the power is. Well, that's Sir Francis Bacon from the 17th century. Knowledge is power. And that's a statement that you've all heard. They taught it in school as a famous saying, and everybody believes knowledge is power. Knowledge does give you some power. But in this movie, this is the driving theme. This is all about this. You know, it's ironic, though, that what Lucy says I have been gathering all this knowledge, my brain's being cut loose, and all this is coming in, but I don't know what to do with it. Isn't that ironic? Knowledge is power. It's all about knowledge, getting as much knowledge as you can possibly get, and she's getting it, and she has more than anybody in the world, and she says, I don't know what to do with it. But that's true with all kinds of power, isn't it? They really don't know what to do with the power that they have. Then, of course, the part in their ways talks about the sole purpose of life being accumulate this knowledge and pass it on. Well, that's important. I mean, that's an important part of life is to learn and to pass it on. You do it with your children, right? I mean, that's a part of, of being a parent is to have this knowledge and to share that with that next generation so that that is passed along. It's important. But is that what the purpose of life is? Chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. 
And then at the end of the clip that I've shown you is where Morgan Freeman says, what governs all that? The answer that they'll give in the movie is not your answer. But it's interesting to see how a humanist looks at all these questions and all these issues, and it will help you better deal with a humanist. Before we jump into the story of the day, which is Samson and his power, a little background. I want to take you back, first of all, to Deuteronomy, a favorite section of mine in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17 primarily, but starting in verse 11. Moses, in speaking to the new generation getting ready to enter the promised land, after coming out of slavery in Egypt and marching through the wilderness for 40 years, the new generation is about to enter the promised land. And Moses is giving final instructions to them. And he gives them a warning. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God. That's a risk for all of us. And we all are in danger of forgetting the Lord our God. But it's interesting to me how Moses puts it here. How do you do it? Forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments. Well, if I'm not going to keep his commandments, I'm forgetting about him. So that's a warning to them as they go into the land. But then a little farther down in verse 17, he gets more specific. And he says, when you go into this land and you get all this stuff, you've been wandering in the wilderness, living in tents. Now you're going to go into the land. You're going to live in houses. You're going to have your cattle. You're going to have all this property. And you're going to be rich. Beware lest you say in your hearts, you say to yourself, by my power and the might of my hand, I have gotten me this wealth. See, we're all inclined to do that, aren't we? Whether it's by whatever it is, whether it's wealth or anything else. If something is achieved, then we think by my power and by my might, and the might of my right hand, I have gotten me this. Then he reminds them in verse 19, it is he, God, who gives you the power to do that. So there's the source of power. Might as well get that out on the table right from the beginning. He is the source of all power, all strength. Any strength that you have is coming from him. And we need to recognize that and not step back and try to take credit for ourselves. We're going to find that with Samson. You're going to find it in your own lives. The next thing is just to remember in the, in the book of Judges, this, and all this is coming from chapters 13 through 16 in the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, remember... They don't have a king, and they go through these cycles of where the people get away from God. They forget the Lord their God. They don't keep his commandments. He sends punishment upon them. They plead to God, he'll please save us, help us out of this mess, and he sends them a judge. But in the meantime, the people are all doing what's right in their own eyes. So we're going to see that in this story this morning. So the people are doing what's right in their own eyes. In this case, he's saying that the Philistines have been controlling Israel for 40 years. Israel has no king. The Philistines are over here on the coast primarily, but actually coming in all the way into Timnah. So they have cities halfway into the land of Israel. Let me just tell you a little bit about some names that you're going to see. Jerusalem, if it had existed at this time, would be sitting right around here. So the top of the Dead Sea is over here. That's what you're seeing the edge of. Here's the Dead Sea. Zorah, which is where Samson is from. And then he's going to go to Timnah to get a wife from the Philistines. He's going to get a Philistine wife. He's going to go down to Ashkelon to, to kill a bunch of Philistines, 30 of them to be exact. We're going to see him go down to Gaza to be with a prostitute. And he's going to carry something heavy for 40 miles to Hebron. All right, so it's just a little bit of background. So it's just in that general area where all this is happening. Part one, Samson empowered by the Holy Spirit. All through 13, you have the birth of Samson, the promise of his birth, the actual birth. And at the end, you have him as a young man. And we're told that the Lord blessed him. As a young man, God was blessing Samson. Then in verse 12, and the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. So things are really starting off well for Samson. God is blessing him. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him. Began to stir him. Now in chapter 14, in verse 1, things look a little rough here, but you have to hang on for a couple of verses to see that it's not quite as bad as it looks. Samson looks out and sees a Philistine woman that he wants to have as his wife. Now we know when they went into the land, they were told not to intermarry. 
Don't intermarry with these people who are in the land. Don't do that. So Samson goes to his father and his mother. Well, that seems to be good. I mean, that's the way things were done at that point. He was doing things the way that they were supposed to be done, going to his father and mother saying, go get this woman to be my bride. They object, of course, because she's a Philistine woman. Samson's response to that is, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Now you're thinking, okay, this is not going well at all, because this is the problem in judges in general, isn't it? Everybody did what was right in his own eyes. So it looks like Samson's just falling right into that trap. But then you have verse 4. And verse 4 sheds a new light on the whole thing. Verse 4 says, His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord. This is from the Lord. God is blessing Samson. The Spirit is coming upon Samson. And this is from the Lord that Samson is to marry this Philistine woman. Now that's against the rules normally it has gone, but this is from the Lord. Samson wins out. The Lord wins out. They go down to Timnah to negotiate the wedding. On the way down, Samson is separated from his parents, it seems, for a moment, and a young lion came running toward him, and you know the story of the lion. Samson rips him apart with his bare hands. Don't tell Peter, but Samson killed the lion. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he tore the lion apart with his bare hands. Not in superhuman power, but in supernatural power. This is important in the story. We're not going to go into the details of this. You know that they go down, they negotiate the deal. They go back home and they're going to come back later to have the wedding. And so when they come back later, Samson stops by the lion and the bees have built a comb inside the lion and there's honey inside the lion and Samson gets some of the honey. And then when he goes down for the wedding, he prepares a great feast because that's what you do. And for a wedding, there's, there was a one week deal. Right? You celebrate for a week. There were a wedding party was put together, 30 men. Samson told of a riddle. The riddle was about the honey and the lion. And if they could guess it, he would give them a bunch of clothes. And if they couldn't guess it, then they had to give him a bunch of clothes. Philistines go to his bride-to-be and tell her that, you know, you really need to get the answer to the riddle for us or we're going to kill you and your father. A little incentive. So she pleads and pleads and pleads with Samson, and finally on the last day, he tells her. And she tells them, they guess the riddle, and Samson is furious, of course, because he now has to pay off. So this is when he goes down to Ashkelon. He goes down 30 miles to the coast, kills 30 Philistines, takes their robes and their garments, brings them back and gives them to the people at the party. In doing that, it's important to notice, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson when he went down to Ashkelon. The Spirit of the Lord. All through this section, what you're seeing is the Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of the Lord is moving Samson to do what God is doing because God is bringing punishment upon the Philistines to give relief to the Israelites. God has allowed the Philistines to punish the Israelites for their departure from him. And now he's bringing that to a halt through the use of the judge, Samson. So he goes down and strikes down 30 men, brings the clothes back and throws them at these men. Now Samson is mad, so he goes home. Well, then he decides, okay, I need to go get my wife. So he goes down to get his wife, but the problem is that the father has given the bride to somebody else because he thought Samson was gone forever. So he gave the bride to the best man. Samson now is furious. Now, he is really mad now because his wife, the woman that he came to marry, has been given to somebody else. So this is where he gets 300 foxes, ties them tail to tail, torch to the tails, and sends them into the grain fields, and he burns the grain. Talk about supernatural. How do you capture 300 foxes? <laughs> and then how do you take them in pairs and tie their tails together? Very carefully. Very carefully, I, I would agree. Samson sets the fields on fire. The father has retaliated against Samson by giving the bride away. Samson's retaliated against the Philistines and the father by burning their fields at harvest time. Now the Philistines retaliate against the father and the bride by burning them like they promised they were going to do if she didn't get the answer. So the Philistines kill the father and his daughter. 
And Samson is even madder now, so he now strikes the Philistines and retaliates against them. Then he goes home. But the Philistines are going to retaliate against Samson. So about a thousand Philistines gather together to go get Samson. The people of Israel have been under the thumb of the Philistines for a long time. And they recognize, still recognize the Philistines as being in control. And now they've recognized that Samson has made them mad. And a thousand of them have come marching in. And unless something is done, there's going to be great destruction in Israel. So 3,000 Israelites, instead of turning to fight the Philistines, go to Samson and say, okay, Samson, you messed up. We're going to take you and hand you over to the Philistines. And Samson says, fine, I'll do that to save the people of Israel from this destruction at the hand of the Philistines. So Samson agrees to let them bind him and turn him over to the Philistines. So we've come to bind you that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. They do that. But as he's marching back, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson and the ropes with which he has been tied melt away. This is where he takes the jawbone of an ass and kills 1,000 Philistines because the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. So he kills 1,000 Philistines with the jawbone of an ass through the Spirit of the Lord. So all through this section, what we've been seeing is this great strength and power of Samson that he has through the Spirit of the Lord. After he finishes this, he was thirsty. This is an interesting little passage. He was thirsty and he called upon the Lord. And look at what he says. You have granted this great victory, this great salvation by the hand of your servant. Samson realizes that this destruction of 1,000 Philistines wasn't by his great strength. It was by God's strength. So this great victory is by the hand of your servant through your power. So God opens this rock and the water pours out of the rock and Samson gets his drink. And then we have in verse 20 of chapter 15, and he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines for 20 years. This would be in the minds of most of us a great place for this story to end. This is great success. And most of us would be more comfortable if the story ended here because God has shown through His great power how He can use a man to do what He wants to accomplish. But the story goes on, and so we'll go on as well. Part two, Samson forgot God. See, that was the warning back in Deuteronomy before they went in the land. Lest you forget the Lord your God. Don't forget the Lord your God by failing to keep His commandments. Samson's going to do that. We start off right away with him going to see a prostitute in Gaza. Samson went to Gaza, saw a prostitute, went in with the prostitute, spent the night with the prostitute. The people of Gaza, the Philistines, these are Philistines now, they recognize that this horrible, horrible man, Samson, is in their city. And so they gather together, we're going to get him when he comes out in the morning. Well, they should have moved faster because Samson at midnight gets up But Samson's going to take the gate of a city that would be solid wood and much, much bigger than double doors to your room, put those on his back and took them 40 miles to Hebron. So he still has a little strength, except now he's using that strength not in the Lord, but he's trying to do everything for Samson. Then his next step is Delilah. Finally, we get to Delilah. And Delilah is another Philistine woman who's not too far away from Gaza. And Samson is in love with her. Samson loved Delilah. Doesn't look like she reciprocated. So the people of her town get together and say, okay, Delilah, find out the source of his strength and we'll each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So that's a lot of money that she's being promised to betray her lover. So she does the thing, you all know the story, you know, Please tell me where the strength of your power is and what we can do to bind you so that you can't get loose. Well, how much intelligence does it take to figure out where this is going? Well, Samson, though, is a strong man, has gotten himself out of all kinds of jams in the past through his strength, and he figures that he can continue to do that. So he says, first of all, bind with seven fresh bowstrings, then bind me with new ropes, then bind the seven locks of my head. She does those things and then calls the Philistines out and then says to Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he breaks loose and deals with it. Does it three times. So she does what his wife had done. 
you don't love me because you won't tell me. And so he gives in. And he tells her that it's because of the symbol of his power. As a Nazarite, his hair was long as a Nazarite, not to be cut. And that was the symbol of his relationship with God. It wasn't his relationship, wasn't his power, but it's the symbol of it. So we're back to the symbol as we discussed earlier. Once she learns that, then she has his hair cut. And Samson says to himself when she wakes up and says, the Philistines are upon you. This is just like the, all the other times. I will now go out and do just like I did before and shake myself free and nothing will happen. Samson was convinced that this was just like the other times. But, and this is one of the saddest verses in the Bible, because this is what happens when we turn away from God and start walking in another direction. We don't realize how far we've gotten. He did not know that the Lord had left him. And so the power to do what he wanted to do was no longer with him. Well, they do to him horrible things. They gouge out his eyes. They take him prisoner. They enslave him in a mill and have him doing the work of an oxen, pushing the grinding wheel to grind the grain. The great failure here of Samson. But it gets worse. They humiliate him. There's a great party being thrown for their great god, Dagon. Because what do they have to celebrate? Well, they have Samson, the guy who has caused them so much trouble for so long. They now have in their possession, and they blinded him, and they are now, he's now their slave. So they're having a big party in this temple. And about 3,000 men and women looked on, and they had Samson come and entertain them through his exhibition of strength. But this is the turning point. We now come to part three. We have paradise regained. Samson returns to God because during this exhibition, Samson gets to lean up against the pillars that are supports for the temple. And Samson called upon the Lord. Samson returned. Samson came back. Samson called upon the Lord. And he bowed with all his strength, pushed the, the pillars, and the house fell upon the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So he killed 3,000 Philistines in his final act through the power that God gave him. He had lost on his own, but he is now God has, has brought back to him, allowed this supernatural act of power to achieve what God wanted to achieve in dealing with the Philistines. Some people have a problem where they look at some of the things that Samson did. For me, this is a great encouragement. Because if you look at any of the people in the Bible, any of the great heroes of the Bible, and look at the failures of those people, I know what my failures are. I know how I have failed. And I know that because he is faithful and because he has dealt kindly with them, he can deal kindly with me. Samson is listed in Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Moses did that. By faith, by faith, all these great men did these great things. And at the end he says, also, I don't have enough time to tell you about everybody, Samson and a bunch of others, but through faith, they did great things. And that's what we've seen through all the story today. Samson, through faith, did great things. When he tried to do things on his own is when he fell flat on his face. And that's when we fall flat on our faces. He was made strong out of weakness. See, that's where we are, actually, when we really know about our situation. We are weak creatures. We are weak but we can be made strong out of our weakness through the power that dwells within us. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Each has received a gift of the Holy Spirit, and it's to serve one another, not for you, but it's for you to serve. As one who serves by the strength that God supplies. God has given you a gift, and He gives you the strength to serve Him and others through that gift. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. Ephesians 3, 20, 21. Now by the power that dwells within you, that's the Holy Spirit, to God be the glory forever because by that power that dwells within you, He can do far more abundantly than all you can ask or imagine. He can do more than you can imagine through the power of the Holy Spirit that's in you. That Holy Spirit has given you a gift. That gift is for you to serve others. That Holy Spirit is giving you the power to do that service. I love to tell the story 
Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love.